hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being so patient and still being here at 6.30. My name is Mariam Kamaha. Um, I'm an architect from Niger in West Africa. And um, I practice both in the urban setting and in rural settings and everything in between. My Interesting. <laughs> um, my, my time is spent between the U.S. and Niger, where I spent half the year in the U.S., the other half um, in Niger, where my entire staff is based, and most of our projects now um, are there. And uh, if you're wondering um, what is Niger, um, you wouldn't be the only person. Um, usually when I meet people, the first thing they, they tell me is, oh, you're the first person from Niger I've ever met. So just to kind of situate you a little bit, Niger is a landlocked country um, in West Africa. Um, and no, it's not Nigeria. <laughs> and I know that's also um, common confusing confusion. It's north of Nigeria, um, near Algeria, Chad, Libya, etc. cetera. Um, one thing that's very pertinent about the country is that it's, um, it's a desert country, actually, which is kind of not the image that you have of Africa. Usually when you think about it, we're thinking more tropical, you know, much greener. Um, and, but climatically, Niger is just a very, very harsh climate where it's incredibly hot, you know, 40, 45 degrees pretty much throughout the year. Um, and the reason why that actually matters is because that's actually one of the single most important things when it comes to architecture, but also when it comes to urban design, obviously. Um, because when, when you're thinking about cities, you're thinking about moving around cities. When you're in a place where temperatures are 45 degrees, all of a sudden you see how that starts impacting whether people actually move about, when they move about, what they do um, in the city. But Niamey, the city where I practice in, is a little bit greener. It's a river city, which makes us just slightly, you know, um, makes, makes the, 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 the context a bit less harsh. Um, but it's, but it, immediately, once you get inside a city, you start seeing, you know, this kind of desert field that starts cropping up. But one thing that's really significant about it, um, just like a lot of developing countries, is the fact that the street in the city is probably the biggest, the, the single most used amenity, and because it's free. Um, and so that's where everything happens. The street is what is taken over for commerce, for example, um, as you can see in this picture. The street is also where a lot of social activities happen. And so, you know, in, in the top um, right image over here, um, you, this is a street, for example, that is, has been shut down. This happens every weekend where streets throughout the city would get shut down for a wedding, for example, because most people don't actually have the means to rent out a venue to do their wedding in, mostly also because we don't have um, invitations. Everybody can come, and so you need a lot of space. But the street is also the place where you sit and watch life go by. So it's almost like what a cafe would be in Paris, for example. But what we do in Niger is that in front of a lot of people's homes, they set up what is called a fada. And a fada is kind of this place where you sit, as you can see um, those young, young men over here, and with your friends drinking tea, you know, playing cards, and sometimes until really, really late um, into the night. But one thing um, that is significant is like, if you can see in those images, um, most of the people who are outside are all men. So the context that I need to also specify is that Niger is a Muslim country. It's a 95% Muslim country. And the city of Niamey is not a place where you will necessarily see women sitting outside um, in that way because it's seen as, you know, being kind of morally loose, you know, or something of that nature. And so for, for girls, um, when I was kind of thinking back about my experiences growing up in the city, one thing that we did to still socialize in the city was, again, use the streets. But we used the streets by walking around. So I think we quickly realized that the problem was staying put and not moving. The fact that you were sitting somewhere or not moving almost was suspicious. But as we were walking around, it kind of made everybody feel like we were going somewhere, but really we weren't. We were actually just going around the neighborhood over and over again for two hours, just over, you know, like a three block radius. So it was kind of, I guess, subconsciously a way to circumvent 
um, some of the so societal norms um, that we had to deal with. And so I started thinking about, you know, an urban project um, surrounding this notion. First, I wondered, well, I wonder if this is still happening in the city, because when I was a teenager, it was a very, very long time ago. And so one of the first things that I did a few years ago was go to Niamey, um, and I met with these young, young women, um, these amazing young women um, that we had discussions with over two days, trying to figure out what are the, really, the issues that they, they encounter, considering that the country and the city has changed a lot. Um, from, from a religious point of view, the society has been getting more and more um, conservative. And so I was wondering if things have gotten better or even gotten worse. Um, and I wanted to share a little bit of my conversation with them with you real quick before we kind of move on to what happened. <laughs> Et qu'est-ce qu'elle doit faire Mm-hmm. That's a à l'intérieur du quartier Non, non. Mm -hmm. Vers où En fait, ce qui m'intéresse, c'est quel genre d'espace vous utilisez quand vous vous baladez À la piscine, ok. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pourquoi? Mm -hmm. Est-ce qu'à part l'école, est-ce qu'il y a un, endroit, un autre endroit que vous pensez que vous pouvez dire à vos parents vous partez et ils n'ont pas de problème? Où ça? Au musée national. Oui, et puis? Ou chez une tante? Uh -huh. Mais quel, quel, un endroit qui n'est pas chez quelqu'un. Pour mmh. okay. pour par exemple, au stade, stade général, c'est Ah oui, pourquoi au stade Parce qu'on est tout là. Pour faire du sport. Où ça là-bas Ah oui ah, C'est bien ça. Pour faire du basket. Oui. Même du tennis. Oui. Okay. Les raisons pour la télé, on veut sortir avec des amis, pour échanger des idées. Mm -hmm. Maintenant, si on ne sort pas des amis, il y, y a des gens qui sortent avec des amis, non? Mm -hmm. et il y a quelque chose que tu ne sais pas, mm -hmm. ils vont te les dire. Mm -hmm. Mais si tu ne sors pas, tu restes toujours à la maison, c'est pas bon. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it was a little bit long, but um, this was actually over almost a full day of conversation. And what that really um, brought to the surface um, for me was that things had changed 
in the sense that actually they were oddly freer than we were when we were younger. When I was their age, um, it was actually badly seen to go to the stadium and play sports. So that was great. But, you know, the, the room was pretty much split in terms of feeling that they actually didn't or shouldn't be out in the streets um, in any form of, in any sort of way. So we started talking about, as you saw at the end, what kinds of activities they felt would be okay for them to do out in the city. Where could they go? And what quickly came up was that it was, so the National Museum, the, the, the National Stadium, so for sports, um, and the National Museum, which is actually kind of this promenade. Um, it's not really a museum, it, it's more of a collection of pavilions in a landscape. And so essentially, what I realized was that they were still doing actually what I was doing when they were their age. They were going there so they would walk around and that they were um, socialized in that way. And then it came up um, that the things that they worried about, you know, that they really cared about wasn't so much about, you know, going around and getting into trouble or anything like that. They just wanted a place where they could be, you know, away from the heat. Uh, where they could have fun, dance together, quiet places. And so it kind of got me started thinking about, well, in that case, wouldn't it be amazing actually if we did some kind of itinerary throughout the city? And an itinerary um, that would kind of put itself at the heart of the city in a way, as a way to draw people, because also it's the, dancers, the denser part of the city. And the idea to, was to first start by linking those two spaces they talked about, the stadium and the National Museum, as a kind of starting point and the starting link um, for that itinerary. And then starting to try to see how to bring in the maximum amount of girls on that itinerary by actually making it go around um, as many schools as possible so that when they come out of school on their way home, or you know, on weekends, sometimes also they go to school to study together. It would be part of you know, the way um, that they use. And it was also really interesting to move um, the itinerary more in the, um, I would say like more underserved areas and also more conservative areas um, religiously, because obviously this is not a problem in some part of the cities who are not as religiously conservative. And so it just became a whole manipulation to try to figure out, I mean, a manipulation of the routes to try to figure out um, the perfect setup, um, getting away from dangerous areas, um, getting away from areas that are too noisy, for example, area where markets are and things of that nature, or where they might feel the gaze on them, you know, where there will be so many people that they would feel kind of scrutinized in that way. And the result was this four mile long um, journey, basically, um, that makes a circle around those two main programs. And the idea was to not only circle those programs, but also create additional program along the route so that they could say, you know, so in a way almost, I, I don't like to say, but it's almost as though those, prog those additional programs are an excuse. So if they say to their parents, okay, I'm gonna go study, this, there are places to study along the itinerary or this place to study um, near the museum, et cetera. And so it was about listening to what they said about the kind of activities they wanted to do and then create small pieces of program all along the route that went along with those activities. So in the end, it ended up becoming something that was almost like a cultural center really, but exploded over four miles essentially um, with a series um, of different interventions um, in terms of um, protecting from the heat. So very simple shading strategies by identifying different areas along the route that tended to be hotter or where there were less trees, um, things of that nature. Um, also trying to investigate, you know, how, how to very, very simply, very cheaply achieve something like that through local materials, through recycled materials, you know, recycled jugs, um, plastic jugs, um, woven, woven mats, or, you know, we have, we use a lot of recycled metal, for example, in Niger. So those were all things that could just quickly um, be used um, to create different types of spaces. But it was really important that um, the spaces that would be created along the route not be hidden. So what I quickly realized was that it couldn't be just a series of buildings because buildings are closed off. And if you go in a place where it's already, you're already being, people are already being suspicious of you being um, 
a description of you walking around, going into an enclosed place doesn't really solve that problem. And so I started looking at different strategies um, on how to create privacy in the open by manipulating the ground a bit more, starting to create places like multi-purpose amphitheaters in some, of the, um, um, in some of the greener areas of the city, for example, by doing these simple things. Or um, a lot of them did, uh, had clubs, you know, where they, they would be outreach programs or they would be, you know, health-related um, advice that would be given by women in the community, um, spaces for things like that but also areas um, that would be more like market-like, where um, that would be desirable for them as a, as a destination, using the same um, design approach. But most importantly, you know, it was really important for me throughout the project to, to try to think about how the city works and how many cities like them work in terms of, again, the way that it uses the street. Because it's a Muslim country, um, we're a very compound, um, wall-oriented um, city, and so everything is behind the compound wall, which means that actually when you're in the street, you just have this blank of just walls keep go that keep going, which is also why people actually use the walls for other things. So like I showed in the beginning for commerce um, or for sitting outside, um, but also for studying at night. In a lot of um, the neighborhoods where there's no electricity, um, the children would come out in the city where there are the lampposts lamp and study. And so it was really interesting because one of the main things that the girls talked about was the fact that they do a lot of studying together. And so we started thinking about how to identify different routes um, throughout the, um, the itinerary where the, the streets would be small enough and, and um, kind of quiet enough to allow for starting to build up this infrastructure against the wall, just like the, what is called the informal economy, which is a whole other story because I have a problem with that term, but whatever. Um, you starting to use that language of the way that we already use the city in a way to really validate it and say, well, actually, this might not be a bad way to start grafting things onto the city. And so the project just really became this itinerary that was inspiring itself from um, the way people go about solving problems, you know, for economy, for socializing, but using it in a way um, to create almost of a subversive, subversive action, I guess, um, to create the kind of space where these women or these girls would be visible at all times and help kind of de-escalate or, you know, make it more normal to see them out or about all the time in the hope that then, you know, it would mean incremental um, changes. And so while this project was, um, you know, theoretical in nature, it was really instrumental um, for the next project that I would like to, to show you um, because it was really the beginning of, of a reflection or introspection, again, about the city um, in the way that, that it functions. And it lent us to this project um, that we're currently working on and that will go under construction um, very soon called the Artisans Valley. And this is a project that came about um, because it inspires itself from a certain condition in the city. Um, the city currently, I mean, this, uh, historically, I guess I should say, this is a city that was created by the French during colonization. And it's a city that was created in a very specific way. Um, there was nothing, there was just a, a fishing village there before. And so when the French made a master plan for the city, um, they placed it in such a way as to divide it in two by using this natural barrier that existed, which was a valley that ran all the way to the river. And they put on one side the indigenous quarters and on the other side um, the European um, quarters. So it created a divide in the city that to this day still exists, except it's morphed, it's transformed. And it's become that what used to be the indigenous quarters of the city now has become the lower income to maybe mid income sometimes. And then what used to be the European um, section is now the high income, um, the, the professional elites of the country. And that divide is even visible um, from a religious point of view. Um, where it's really, you really feel like you live in two different cities because of that valley and because of the history that, that the city comes with. You even see it from a vegetation point of view. When you actually go from one side of the valley to the other, all of a sudden things become greener, lusher, quieter, the plots are bigger, etc., etc. And so post-independence, 
um, this man who is um, a scholar, a thinker, a poet, um, an author in Niger, and he was also a politician for some time, um, had this idea to take this negative um, thing that, was, um, that is embedded in the DNA of the city and turn it into something positive. And he had this idea um, to make cultural programs all along the valley as a way to bring and to stitch, in a way, the city together. And he called it La Vallée de la Culture, or Culture Valley, hence the name of the, um, um, of the project a little bit. A little bit. And so, at, at Independence, the National Museum already existed, and it actually is named after him. Um, and so the idea was to create this access, you know, with all of these different programs along the way. And for us, you know, when this project was, was brought to us, we immediately saw, you know, the opportunity to actually make this mobile loitering thing happen in a way, even, 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 even if it's for different reasons. Um, by actually conceiving um, this cultural valley as a promenade, as a way, um, to bring a lot of these activities together. And it became even more obvious that that was the way to go because the city is currently developing a lot of um, public space projects. And so you can see from both sides of the, of the river, there are massive, massive um, programs on the way currently to create public space, to create housing, to create picnic areas, to create swimming areas and things of that nature. And so it was just very easy for us to, to then say that, well, the Cultural Valley then should just be this um, highway, pedestrian highway, that brings the whole city to the water. Because as many cities who are river cities, um, the river was only being used as a sewer, for example. And now, uh, and, and the city was turning its back on the river. And now the effort is to bring people um, more towards the water. But it was really difficult to figure out where to start. Like this Cultural Valley, you know, idea is supposed to be multiple, multiple projects. And so the first project ended up being um, this idea to bring out all the artisans. Crafts are really, really important in Niger. Um, and there are certain ethnic groups that do certain kind, kind of crafts. And so um, the smallest project, you know, that the city could, was coming up with was to create space along the route for those craftspeople in order to also provide them better economic opportunity because right now they're hidden away either in the museum, which means that you actually have to pay money to be able to go and purchase things from them, which is a little insane, um, or they would be in other places that are only tourist areas, for example. So we started working on this idea to pepper them um, throughout, the, um, throughout the itinerary um, as a way for not only bringing um, the population there, but also bringing the population more in contact with the daily craft um, of their culture, going along with the theme of the Culture Valley. And so the very first site that we have um, was um, this site where the valley goes through, and it's actually kind of a little bit of a sewer on top of that. So it was really challenging, um, but it's, it's right where downtown ends in, the, in, in a way. Um, this, the city is very flat. There aren't very many tall buildings, but this is one of the areas where there's a few four or five um, tall bu buildings there and not that many residential. And so when thinking about that, you know, my question was, well, what is it exactly that we're trying to do? You know, um, this, is, this is a place that is divided, as I showed. This is a place where um, that divides the people who have plenty and the people who don't have much. And this is a place that is very much a divide between an elite and a not so elite. And so I started thinking about um, something that would be interesting would be actually to bring what is considered the least elite thing you can possibly think of, which is village life and village typology into the urban um, realm where we think that it doesn't belong because, those type, because we have kind of um, espouse the idea that unless we make cities that look like, you know, a city in Europe or that look like a city um, in the U.S., then we have not evolved or we are somehow lesser than. So I started being really interested in these structures. These are granaries um, where in villages they store grains after every rainy season in Niger. And it's these kind of beautiful pieces of craft, which is another reason why I was interested in, because this is supposed to be a value for craftsmen, um, that they make by hand. And they make these really thin, delicate shells um, by just taking, you know, clumps of clay and just molding them by hand and making these perfect shapes. 
And so we started playing around um, with the shape and try to see how we can, and, and in a way also, I always thought that they, they look like these, this installation. Um, and the fact that we were supposed to have all these individual spaces and all these individual pods, in my mind kind of started to evoke the idea of almost of an intellectual, of a spectacle almost in the middle of the city. And so looking at the site that we have, this is a photo um, on the ground level of our site. Um, it just really became evident that, you know, considering how vacant it was, how open and just how empty and desert-like it was, um, one way maybe that we could bring people over, it was by creating something of a spectacle in that way. And so we started playing around with this idea of, you know, not only the shape, but deconstructing the shape, but keeping this lightness and this delicateness and almost kind of, um, almost, almost as though if, if a sandstorm came through, the whole thing would kind of collapse in a way. Um, and it became um, this thing that could be replicated in many, many different sites all along the Culture Valley um, as these series of pods that can be manipulated and turned into different um, kinds of things and different kind of program. Because one thing that the city was really interested in wasn't so much to create just space for commerce um, for the artisans. They were really interested in, cre in turning it into a real public space. The, um, the valley is currently somewhat dangerous because it's now well lit, because you know, there aren't that many people who go through there. And so what they really wanted to do was to create a place that would be alive day and night. So by day, the artisans could sell their wares. By night, we could really actually activate the place through different things like, you know, like outdoor movies, um, different places to hang out, you know, to even throw small parties and things like that. Basically a place where we can have happenings happen. And so it ended up looking a little bit like this, where you just have kind of this series of little, you know, clustered um, pavilions in a way, um, where you can, that you can turn into all kinds of um, different type of program while keeping the unity of it all. Um, and that you can hang out, as I was saying, you know, at night, bring your family, um, and you really turn the identity of this place around. And so ultimately, you know, for me, this project was just a great way to explore well, how do we start thinking through spaces like these that have been, that, that have kind of this bad history, this negative history, and how do you start also reclaiming some of your identity in a way and, not apo and stop apologizing for the things that are there where you are instead of trying to emulate something that comes from elsewhere. So it was kind of a, a great um, testing block um, to really help bring in something positive in a place that had just for so many years, for so many decades, been the synony synonymous with kind of the oppression that happened in the city. And that's where I wanted to show you today. Thank you.